Hello and welcome to Movie of the Year, the only podcast on the internet that has the science and the screaming to determine what is the single greatest movie of any given year. My name is Ryan, this is 1982, and we are almost done with it. Do you know how you can tell? Because we did movies in alphabetical order this season, and the movie tonight starts with a V. <laughs> the, uh, last week did too, that's Verdict, but that's V-E, this is V-I. I'm really all about the alphabetization of movies. <laughs> uh, I spent a lot of time working in video stores. I can alphabetize movies so f- it's my number one skill. And guys, there is no call for that skill at all anywhere on the planet anymore. As I said, my name is Ryan, and this is just a bonus episode. This is not the full on competition. So I can introduce my friends as if they are my actual friends, not just that, but friends with each other, starting with Mike. Hello. I thought you were into alphabetization. Because you have a toddler, and it's just clear that all you've been doing is going through the alphabet with her. I'm really into shapes lately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you colors. guys, Greg? Do you think that shapes have certain colors? Like, what is a square supposed to be colored? Green. Probably red. Oh uh, yeah, I. It's. I was gonna say blue, but it's definitely not. I know for a fact it's not green. Yeah, it's maybe a, a triangle will be green. See, triangles are yellow. Yellow. To me. <laughs> yeah, yeah they triangles are. are yellow for sure. I definitely think a circle is blue. I could see. I could see a blue yeah. circle. Yeah, I can see a red circle. Uh, what about an oval? For me, I'm just thinking, teal. I'm just thinking about that oval and how pink it is. Mm. Purple. Yum, 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 <laughs> yum, yum. All right, guys, mm. we have an important movie to talk about. We have our second uh, gender bender of 1982. Over the last three weeks, we did Tootsie a couple weeks ago. We did Victor Victoria. I was so scared before we watched Tootsie, and yeah. it turned out okay. I was we made it. I was less scared for Victor Victoria because I think it seems more proper. Did Victor Victoria do okay for you guys? As far oh, as yeah. like the cringe level works. Oh. Yeah. You know, any movie is going to have some cringe, especially the way we watch him, but uh like overall, no I wasn't uncomfortable before watching it. I was not uncomfortable during watching it, and I'm perfectly comfortable now. The it was delightful. The 82 has some sleepers. This and Night Shift are, I think, now in my wife's and I annual rewatch yeah. movies for how much we were giggling and chortling. This just feels like every era of movies yeah. in one thing. All crammed like, into one. Yeah. Not even just movies, but like stage productions. Oh, this yeah. very much feels like old school vaudeville. Um, everybody like selling out to entertain every moment possible. Even with that, it manages to slow down at times, mm-hmm. but it has so much heart and joy and love in it that I found myself forgiving and then eventually embracing all of its like foibles or rough edges. It's the kind of movie that really invites you to like think of it almost as like a friend or a family. That, it's, it, yeah, like I can't believe how quickly this movie is like, hey, hang out with me and you'll yeah. enjoy yourself. And I was like, fuck yes, I will. And I did. It, it has a heart of gold, and you can tell when it missteps. It doesn't mean anything by it. Like, and I think yeah, I think that the, we're going to get into this in the uh, next segment. But like, I think that the director has a reputation of being a little like I don't know harsh and kind of pervy and weird. And I think that this movie just it, it really stands out in his oeuvre as oh yeah like what a like I could watch this with any member of my family and be okay. If you feel- look at like the catalog of his movies, like literally the box covers of his movies, some of them would make you feel so uncomfortable. So I don't totally, I totally have to like it seems like he's got so many weird, outrageous sex comedies. And there is that element to this, but it's contained in a way that doesn't make it uncomfortable. Greg, one of his movies is called SOB, and that B stands for bitch. <laughs> what? I know. And not Gross. Like- I'm out. <laughs> I'm storming I'm out, out of the podcast about tonight. So you won't watch this movie because of the acronym title of another one of his movies. I will I will strike this movie from the record. Forget that I watched it because the title of one of his other God, movies. God, if you could take one, if you could strike one movie from anybody's record, Greg, Ooh. would it be Verdict from Mike because he's been saying this nonstop since <laughs> then. God, Mike, you can't strike real things from real life. Greg strike that from the record. <laughs> I will, Mike. No, I never said it. <laughs> luckily, luckily like I'm getting to a certain age, so uh, I can like strike things from the record whether I want to or not. Yeah. <laughs> Six shots of Jameson. I can strike so much from the record. <laughs> All right. There's so much to talk about with this movie. Um, I'm excited that it was like here at the end. I'm excited yes. to, to um, that it was you know a week or two away from Tootsie. 
like mm-hmm. 82 what a magical land you were uh so without further ado let's get into victor victoria hey guys thank you so much for listening so far and let me just tell you that everything ahead of this commercial is much better than what came before it that's my guarantee while i have you here let me tell you about a website it's called yourpopfilter.com and it's everything you need that's related to pop filter everything mike everything ryan everything greg everything cassie everything is there at yourpopfilter.com while you're there go to yourpopfilter.com slash amazon make that your new amazon bookmark and do your shopping from there that way we get a little piece of the action and amazon doesn't make sure you're also listening to everything that pop filter has to offer which includes the superhero show show a podcast that covers every single TV show that's based on a comic book or comic book property, and Movie of the Year, where we sit down and try and figure out what is the single greatest movie of any given year. That's Superhero Show Show, that's Movie of the Year, and that's yourpopfilter.com. Rate, subscribe, review. In the mid-70s, Hollywood legend and legendary cad, Blake Edwards wrote a screenplay for his wife, Julie Andrews. Based on the 1930s German movie Victor und Victoria, and not a Broadway musical, the, <laughs> the movie would tell the story of Victoria Grant, a broke singer who teams up with Toddy, a different broke singer, to create Count Victor Grzynski, the greatest drag queen performer of all time. Everything is going swimmingly, as evidenced by a montage, until men love the mob, blondes, and musical numbers get in the way. Taste buds, I ask you this. Between those musical numbers, the farce, the way the camera moves, and the general style and feel of Victor Victoria, is this the oldest movie we've ever watched for Movie of the Year? Keep in mind that this is 1982. We have done 1975. It, th- but this is the oldest movie, right? It, yeah, it's a screwball comedy with platonic leads. That's what this movie is, and it feels so 40s, 50s in all the best ways. It feels like it comes from a time before they did as much of a a job like stamping out homosexuality in movies by 82. If if, like the other movies we've watched, people would be like gay people, huh? I've heard about them, but I wonder what they're really like, but like they're ghosts or, uh, you know, like, uh, like a foreign myths of your, yeah. And you would think watching, you might think watching eighties movies. Oh yeah. I guess nobody ever really talked about, homosexuals before now and this is just the very beginning of that but if you actually roll back the clock in hollywood like and i know this is based on old german movie but old hollywood movies were way gayer than this and so even that feels like a throwback but i wonder i think like if let's make a movie let's make an old school hollywood movie where the all the the gay stuff that is supposed to be in the background is now in the foreground because that's that's the world we live in now and not like, yeah, and I, I think we'll probably get more into into the, that community. But if nothing else, part of what makes this feel like very old and classically, you know, Hollywood is that so much of it is dedicated just to be being entertaining, being fun, being kind of like a romp. And even in the moments where it's celebrating kind of really bad entertainment, which is... <laughs> Like, what seems to be the center of this is not, like, your highbrow entertainment, not your best entertainment, but instead people kind of, like, selling out and failing really hard for entertainment. That's, like, sort of brought to the forefront. Mike, let's... It's, go ahead. I was going to say, it's it's the part of why it feels so old and is the screwball and is the, the entertaining is at a certain point the movie stops just to watch Julie Andrews and Harold Hill from The Music Man talk. They're just riffing, and now that's the show. And the whole restaurant is like, this is what we're watching from now on, is watching them mix stuff up. And it's having these two leads, I think, helps it feel that old school and just sail past everything. Let's talk- so many of their lines are actually kind of groaners, but like yes. again, the things that about this movie that are not perfect or are not like done 100% as well as they could be are the things you end up loving. So you end up... By, like, the third or fourth groaner, you're like, okay, I get it. This is pretty fun. There's, I mean, like, the screenplay, I think, is amazing. And I think the groaners are sort of on purpose most of the time, right? But it just, it's just lightning. It's just every line is lightning. And it's not like they're the funniest person. There's not a ton of, like, laugh-out-loud jokes here. But you're smiling the entire time. And charm. Yeah, charm. And it's... 
what's it? Uh, Joss Whedon has taken a lot of shit recently for creating the awful dialogue that we get in movies now. And I know it's fun to pile on Joss Whedon because he seems to be a terrible, terrible person. But uh-huh. his whole thing of, um, oh, he's behind me, isn't he? You know, that kind of like pattern. They fly now. <laughs> yes. Um, that's sort of all of the screenplays that we get now. Here we get like, um, uh, Toddy says, well, what if I die in the middle of the night? Well, that can't happen. Why not? Because the middle of the night was two hours ago. And it's not a joke. It's just sparkles. Like the, it, yeah. it just sparkles the entire time, you know? And well, then every once in a while, someone uncorks what is a legitimate laugh out loud line. I can't believe how high the highs are in this movie. Mm-hmm. Probably three of the funniest lines of like any movies we saw for 82 are in this movie. Let's, Mike, you said, I, I said farcical, you said screwball. I like that word better. Um, this is a screwball movie. This is a two hour episode of Frasier. And I mean, I say that in like the most lovingly way possible. How mm. did that play? How did Blake Edwards do it? There are two uh, building wide brawls and one at a bar, one at a diner within the first 25 minutes of this movie. Not to mention the whole like mistaken identity. Is he in this room? Is he in this room? Mm-hmm. All of that stuff. Did that play? Well, I think a lot of it did. The the antics and the mistaken identities plays, and I, I think I I'll even go with the brawls. I like that stuff a lot. I you love the brawl when it goes screwball. It's working. The farcical stuff that's like on the margins. That like his nephew had to get a job or something, so he created this private investigator character. Like it gets so odd and is like, no, you're pushing too hard into. Like, it's like he didn't realize what he had been doing, and then he added this Pink Panther fucking character. Mm -hmm. I don't think the movie is always 100% respectful of our time. (laughs) I think that... (laughs) I think that some of the... And I think it's okay to to say that they're farcical because they're, like, of that that, uh, dramatic tradition or that comedic tradition or whatever. Those a lot of those scenes where someone is like hiding and then going from place to place, that's a lot of movie. Like there's a lot of time dedicated to that. And I would agree about the uh, inspector except that is one of the funniest lines in the movie when the guy's like be careful and the inspector's like I'm always careful. <laughs> and he's like no cuz that chair you're sitting in is broken. And then the guy goes down so hard and he like <laughs> hits a glass like across the room on his way down. <laughs> that is such a good fall. That I did, think the as other problem I groaned throughout all of that character existing that line I that think, moment yeah. was beautiful. The other problem too is the first forty minutes or so, like basically until Toddy has the idea, the premise, the reason we came to watch the movie, is so magical. It's so, like just watching uh, Victoria and Toddy together is so great that like it just once you add plot and machinations, it all kind of goes downhill from there. Well, and they keep every. 20 minutes they keep adding plot yeah and so by the end when it's like and we'll talk about it later but so by the end when the mob's there it's just like why <laughs> uh <laughs> and yeah that, that that's i think this is good despite what's the cat's name blake edwards mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. this is good despite blake edwards oh I, really you think it's it's i think it's good maybe in spite of some of his worst impulses mm. but i think that he's at the he is at the heart of what makes this good i i and feel I think, like because julie andrews appeared naked in the last movie she was in directed by blake edwards and i this feels like she was like i was fucking mary poppins make a movie for me and he was like yeah, all right yeah. i will write this screenplay then i thought that that was going to happen in this movie mm. and it made me feel so uncomfortable the, the whole time and i don't know <laughs> i think it's because she's mary poppins yeah. and so i was like i don't really want to see it. what movie is it that she was naked in and, and why i think sob okay and it's because it does it does have that dirty word in the title so i thought she was gonna do the like what is it that movie one of the guys i thought she was gonna <laughs> like to prove that she was a woman like rip open her shirt at one point and i was so glad when that didn't happen because i was like uncomfortable the <laughs> entire time thinking it was going to there's another movie called flirting with disaster with ben stiller this is from the 90s and in that one mary tyler moore rips open her shirt it's like what are we doing guys <laughs> like let's not Let's not do this. The musical number is is the other thing. Um, we talk a lot about what is a musical. And first of all, I just want to sort of define that real quick. Because I don't know if we've done that in a while. I, I've always thought that a musical is when uh, characters sing sort of in a, in a fantasy world. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. B, I feel so strongly I have to sing now. The right. reality of the of the world, they're not actually singing. So does that mean that that thing you do, is that not a musical? Because that's just about a band that sings a lot of songs in the movie. Yeah. <coughs> I would not count that as a musical. Okay. And, so- and I guess I would too, but then I have to, I have to say I agree with that definition. If it's got like the people singing in the world of the movie. But I have to say, I find then with this particular movie that gets unsatisfactory because this movie stops everything to have several big musical song and dance numbers. And yes, they're not actually the characters expressing themselves really, I guess by singing, but it feels unsatisfactory to be like, eh, it's not really a musical though. That and they sing their songs and I will let you two define what I'm about to say. However you want, they sing their songs to completion. And that's some like in like that thing you do or where it's like all diegetic music they don't do that. Like it's just a, it's just a clip or a blip. They are putting on a show every time there's a song being sang, and we watch that entire show. The 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 last part of the high of the entire movie is like a a, a a song and dance number. Like the movie ends on one, and it, that's the one. And I guess that's the reason I think it's not a musical. Is we see versions of that one three times, I believe, <laughs> and that's like <clears throat> Vic, Victor's big closer is this. About a lady in Spain, and there's the the bullfighter, and they're dancing, and it's very funny. Uh, and then they they trade, and that, but that's why it it feels to me this is like that thing you do where this is about performers, and they just happen to also in a very like old school Hollywood where it's like here's a giant stage and dance numbers versus modern musicals where they're still just in their apartment in the streets or whatever. I think that the fact that we see entire songs right, like start to finish like we're an audience in the show. I think that pushes me closer to this is a musical. And this is all arbitrary. It doesn't fucking matter. But um But like how weird is it? Like okay, here here's an example. When the when the girlfriend sings the Chicago number, uh-huh. Miss uh, Scarlet from Clue? Yeah, Leslie Ann Warren. Like that the that Warren is, piece. There's <laughs> Literally, there's an explanation for it. I guess she's also a performer, but the the audio, like the viewer, never knows that before she sings that. She's just suddenly singing. It's just the middle of a number. All of a sudden, I, I don't know. It, it definitely feels like this movie is at least trying to maybe blur those lines a little bit. But and Blake Edwards is like come in to this theater, even though it's 1982 and it's not 1942, and you're gonna get everything. You're gonna get. You yeah. know the comedy. You're gonna get the 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 love and the drama, and you're gonna get the musical numbers. I just think that the movie stalls out because he is not, to me, equipped to direct them. And I don't think that right. every musical number has to be shot like Busby Berkeley shot it, or even Bob Fosse shot it. Right? Like it doesn't have to be uh, Boz Lerman like mm-hmm. woohoo style. But he is really just like throwing up a camera and waiting until he can tell dirty jokes again. He is Kevin Smithing the musical. He is moment. Kevin Smithing the <laughs> musical. Which is that's Not part of why I it. thought this must have been a stage production before it was actually a movie because of the very two-dimensional way in which he frames and like executes his dance numbers. But man, it, it's not on stage anymore. If it was on stage first, it's no longer make a movie yeah. out of these parts. Like, okay, what's the deal? I, I assume this is just a joke or something, but there's like several tap dancing numbers where they just don't show the, the character's feet and it's clear they're not dancing. <laughs> why put that in there? Like Budget. It, Get get rid of that. You didn't sell like you don't have tap dancing in your movie. It's so awkward to watch somebody pretend to tap dance. <laughs> in 1982, Greg, I'm not going to a movie that doesn't have tap dancing. That's insane. Okay, that's true. Yeah. 82 loved tap dancing. That's what they say. What did you guys think about the, focusing on the musical numbers now? The the Miss Scarlet piece uh, at when she Ace Ventura at her butt and made her butt sing. <laughs> Man, she really got she <laughs> grabbed class that act. thing, dude. She's nominated she, for uh, best supporting actress, by the way. Well, she should be. Yeah. She, she yeah. was amazing in this. The depth of her performance was, at first, you're like, oh, she's a floozy. But, man, she goes all over the place <laughs> in this performance. It's really interesting. And I think gets it more than yes. anybody what we're doing here. Like, of, like, hearkening back to old. It's such an old archetype that she's playing. And there's no um, self-consciousness in the way she plays it. And I can I can even see on, on the page how she was like, I guess I'll take this role. But then really opens it up maybe the screenplay had everything for her to do but man this could have been such a two-dimensional character oh yeah yeah. i I think she adds a lot to it for sure all right we're gonna take a break but when we come back we're gonna talk about the gayness of this movie 
All right, gentlemen, another 1982 movie that uh, we're so scared that might be problematic, but let's see if it was. What does this movie say about the gay community and its tensions with the straight community versus intra-community tensions with the gay community itself? That's part of what I liked about this movie is I feel like so often if you've got gay characters existing, and this happens with a lot of like marginalized groups, that like it's about what it's like for them to interact with the dominant culture and the way that the dominant culture... And that's like that's a fine message. Obviously, it's an important message. But so often, it's kind of reductive because then it's just like, well, how do you interact with the straights? We, and this we movie, still need... like we, we still have to put you at... We're still going to other you in yeah. your own movie. We're like, how do you relate... Because you're all the same, right? Yeah. <laughs> and how do you relate to the main block is what the... Uh, conflict is going to be and this movie is about like what it's like to run in queer communities and like have to try to um stay important and stay like at, at near the top when everybody is like kind of gunning for your position and like i think a toddy at one point says like you're all so kind i've got there's all kinds here that's the yeah. other thing it like it shows that like there's a lot of diversity within the community as well <laughs> I think part what helps that is a boon to it is that it's not just what's the gay community like it's this is the gay expat performing arts community in Paris in 1932 it like really narrows down what yeah. we're dealing with here and how people code switch and jump in and out and toddy I think because of his age and his prowess even when he's kind of down on his luck does not code switch ever right he's just like I'm toddy bitches and I'll always be toddy Right, I, I mean, bobbing your head like, eh. I, yeah, I think that, like, because work is work, right? So I do think he's a professional. And even though he's in Paris, I do think that there's some stuff that he tones down when people are looking. But if you watch him when nobody's looking, it's like, it's very, it, like, he's just much more effeminate when nobody is looking. And I think that he does use that voice that he has, that g incredible tool. Like, my goodness, Robert Preston's voice. Uh, when... It's basically like from Dune. Like his voice is so powerful <laughs> that he can like make people do stuff with it. I mean, I'm sure he's a great singer, but even when he's sing talking, the audience is like, "Oh, hello, buddy." It's it's so easy because the only thing I knew him from was the Music Man, which was like a constant rewatch as a kid. And and the Music Man, he played the uh, monorail salesman. Yes, he was the monorail salesman. I'm sorry, <laughs> right. I have to translate to you guys. Yes, <laughs> he. Uh, this is more of a Shelby Vila. <laughs> But you can see how he hoodwinked an entire town because <laughs> look at him. Yeah, oh, just I'll, sure, whatever dude. you want, I'll do it. <laughs> and I, what's interesting to see is he's going through what it's like to be like an aging member right. of this community. And you see him both dealing with that externally with like his boyfriend who... Like not his boyfriend, obviously, like the the guy he's sleeping with, and they've got like this really uncomfortable sort of like understanding that you see break up and then be a source of tension all throughout the the movie. But in that, you also see him like literally in that scene where he's talking to that that guy. The guy opens a door at one point, and it's just a mirror right on Toddy, and you see Toddy really like taking in himself yeah. as like an as he says later, an old queen and. It's heartbreaking yeah. like to, to, to watch him go through that in a way that is just as important to set on film as like any other sort of like heartbreaking thing that might happen to, to a member of that community. Especially because these moments come when he's by himself. Yeah. And when he like movies love to make people like this, the villain, like like going back to All About Eve, but especially like queer people like this who are like, I'm I've aged out. Or I'm not understood, or you know, like um, it, it's a straight person's world, and so I'm gonna do villainous things. And instead, he is the most like empathetic, generous, generous like helpful person who saves all these moments for when he's by himself. And what is more heartbreaking than that? Mm -hmm. And that's why I think his arc, I think, is really important uh, of going from day day paying this. I, I think Richard, I think that's the character's name. His the the man he's with in the beginning is not out and then going ah. from Richard, but he's younger and uh, you know, he's fit to Bernstein, the bodyguard who comes out of the closet, like an older man, like, Bernstein, squash, <laughs> squash Bernstein. Uh, like, I think that that is very important because it's like the trappings of who, who am I trying to surround myself with? Is it like this young ingenue or is it 
No, I, I want somebody I can kind of share a life with, and that's what that feels like. And also, that guy was a football player in real life, Alex Karras, right? And also raised Webster. And he raised Webster, yeah. Like, that guy was a football What an interesting choice for that character, because he is so tough. And yeah. then the, like, the fun moment where Squash finally realizes he needs to be true to himself. Uh, maybe Alex Karras should not be put up on a pedestal for taking this role, but for 1982, I feel like, bro. Hell yeah. Nice job. Like, that's awesome. Um... So we have um, the older guy with Toddy. Let's get into Squash. Did that feel out of nowhere? Did that feel like, oh, we just have to add to the screwball? The one moment, and, and Squash was pretty screwball before he came out yes. of the closet. Uh, the, but the one moment that I was like, is this movie being like, haha, gay? The only time it thought that is when Squash thinks his boss is gay. He says, uh, if a guy like you can admit, admit it so can i uh and i didn't know if it was being played for laughs or mocking squash but the way the rest of the film handled it i was like maybe not i got those same vibes though mike and i think that's just because our antenna is always up for yeah. stuff like that and because but especially a 1982 was movie a yeah. joke it was getting trapped in closets and hiding on snowy balconies yeah. like he was only like ha ha look at the big guy before Plus, that Alice Karras punched a horse in Blazing Saddles and uh, was in Webster, the funniest show of all time. So we're expecting Ha Ha. Like, he's <laughs> one of our great comedians. But then by the end, I think he's a very emotional character. Like, when he's happy and yeah. out uh, and Toddy throws him a rose, it's like a l- almost dusty. Almost dusty, especially because um, what's Garner's name? Toddy? No, James which Garner. One's Garner. King Marchand. King Marchand. King. How did I forget yeah, the name dude. King? Uh, when King says, what are you talking about? I'm like, yeah. Uh, mm. That doesn't break uh, Squash's spirit. That doesn't break his character. He's like, oh, I thought you were. Anyway, I like how I'm out now. And like, yeah. that's the rest of the movie. I think that's a crazy And movie. you see him flower. And that yeah. is, that, that's like such a true thing. Like When people admit who they are, in my experience, you always see that person yes. flower, like, the, and, and really become a, a, the best version of themselves. And that move, this movie really like shows that with Squash. Well, what I like is so as a film, it doesn't flatten out queerness like we've talked about, and the straight folks go back and forth and deal with it in nuanced ways. They're not yeah. either I'm just an ally or uh, I'm going to be a villain no matter what. King Marchant's relationship with queerness is very nuanced for 1982. And has numerous steps. There's not one moment where he's like, and now I'm fine. There's a moment where he's like, oh, I'm okay with people thinking I'm gay. And for a while, you're like, oh, look at that. And then he's like, nope, went out with who everybody thought was a man. So now I guess I got to get in the biggest bar fight ever just to (laughs) prove to myself. Like, which I think is so crazy. Like, I think nuance is the best word. Like, these are these are difficult things for a dude like King Marjan and. You know, for him to... Uh, His friends literally come to, like, kill him and take everything from him just because they hear through the grapevine that he's gay. <laughs> right. So, like, the, 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 the stakes are super high. And his manly... And he, but he tries. He's like, you yeah. know what? I'm going to attempt to uh, not have this be such a big deal. And I also love how um, Victoria, in the beginning, right when she meets King Marchand, is like, that man is a fucking pig. Yeah. God damn, do I want to sleep with him? Like, yeah. yeah, like that's okay to admit as well, you know. Like, and Toddy's like, "Yep, same, same." Me too. <laughs> well, that's that. There's a a moment that I think is very important, but between Victoria and King, uh, when that we're on the bed, it's it's calm, it's uh, mature, it's honest, and he's trying to get her to be like, "Well, we're in love," and this feels so 1940s movies, right? Like, well, we. Slept with each other once, so we're going to get married. What's our right. life look like now? And I totally buy in. Totally fine. But he's like, well, I mean, you're you're a woman pretending to be a man to pre- pretend to be a woman. She's like, yes, that's the plot of the movie we're in. <laughs> did, you guys, she, did you guys feel like there's a lot of lines written for the trailer in this yes, movie? Like, there's for a lot sure. of... Sorry, Mike. So keep going. You didn't have to have a voiceover person being like, Victoria was down on her luck. <laughs> that's one of the ways in which it's really broad. It's like, like, there's like little recaps halfway through it. It's like, I, some of you may not have been paying attention. Here's what's going on. Uh, but her response of like says the businessman who's pretending he's a gangster pretending yeah, he's a businessman. Yeah. And so my movie... wife would snap so hard if she heard that. <laughs> so the movie is saying like we all have these little roles we play and lie to each other, each other and society. Like, and so we're all the same. So just because it has to do with where genitals go, fucking chill out. And I don't think the movie's like let's end all the lies. 
right? No, it's, it's just, not like everybody. It's just like let's can we let's be a little bit less judgmental about yeah. the lies. Yeah, and let's not like have to confront everybody's lies. Like if the lies that people tell themselves to get themselves through the day, you don't have to disabuse people of those lies. But let's not use the lies against each other. Well, you said you didn't eat French fries, but you here the receipt says you did, so you're no worse than a murderer. <laughs> well, I Things did like also that. murder the fast food worker. I see a lot of that in the in the girlfriend Norma too. That that she's obviously the character herself is obviously spending so much of the time jumping between different characters that she thinks she has to play in that world. Like when she uh -huh. wants to tell on King Marchand, she like does the dance number and then goes over to his rival and obviously makes it clear that she has something she needs to tell him. And then as soon as he's like, okay, what is it? She like snaps into a completely different persona and is like, okay, I've got, I've got the inside information on King Marchand. <laughs> well, it's she, that, that moment, cause it's not his rival. That is like his best friend and yeah, his was buddy. business partner until they found out he's queer. Like, She's so good. I'm so glad yeah. that we have another reference besides Clue for this actress, because she's yes. amazing in this movie. And that that that, that moment of realization that it's Miss Scarlet's like, oh yeah, why is it? Because it's it's like not Susan Sarandon. That's who, who is this? <laughs> right. No, that. But like, I do think that you're right. Like, there was like a a market reclamation of Susan Sarandon had to get famous, therefore yeah. Leslie Amor did not. Also, you never see anyone use a halberd as a weapon anymore, and she really, she's really comfortable with that thing. <laughs> is that a like a slingshot? It's like an axe uh, like spear. A... It's like that spear that she used to spear the door when she was attacking them. Classic Leslie Ann Warren. Let's take a break, and when we come back, let's talk about the mob. Hola, Felterinos. I just wanted to interrupt real briefly and say thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. If you want to support us a little more directly, you can go to patreon.com slash yourpopfilter. There, depending on what tier you pick, $1 a month, $5 a month. If you're crazy, anything more than $5 a month, don't do that. You can get extra content. There's extra shows, extra series, uh, behind-the-scenes stuff. Uh, you can pay for Ryan to draw you a picture. Uh, I can write you a poem. You can get the shirts off our very own backs. All of that and so much more over at patreon.com slash your pop filter while you're on the internet you should check out shady monk he does all the tunes you've been listening to he's on Bandcamp. he's on spotify uh soundcloud wherever kids get their music these days that i'm too old to know shady monk lives there uh you can probably follow him on twitter and instagram as well that's shady monk wherever you get music check him out this is an oddly structured movie let's be honest it feels old school but it feels like we don't have to hit the plot points of other 1982 blockbusters. The addition of the mob plot feels a little bit late. Did it need the extra oomph in the back third, or did it distract from the point of the movie? It it bummed me out. <laughs> like, it's straight up like, I was fine with a lot of the screwball and farce and who was what, but like... I'm fine been... with this farce, but that's it. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. This is my shit. Uh, I, I won't be so neutral to say I'm fine with it. But, but the, by the time the mob is getting in the way, like I loved the final number, and it just felt like the mob shit, we could have had more cool emotional character moments on our way to that final number instead of what we got, which feels like even like Three Men and a Little Baby. A little baby? Uh, three Men and a Little Baby. <laughs> has mob stuff right like they, there's something about the 80s that's where true they, yeah they, they really do feel like they need to mobify everything <laughs> the mob was so busy in the 80s fucking up with everybody's premises um, i wonder if also it's it's like a way in which they could work in i don't know kind of nazism i guess because you know the, the original movie is set in 1934 berlin and like that's around the time where i think things are about to start taking a pretty dark turn in berlin for things to get all the way over to paris i think takes a little bit longer but all over europe there is a rise of fascism at this mm -hmm. time and so i wondered if it was a way to sort of make an analog for that you know to sort of bring that in without bringing it in necessarily the way that i saw it was that this is sort of how the screwball farcical comedies work is that we're just going to add element after element after element until like the the house it's so zany. The room is just full of zaniness, mm -hmm. and I think that the reason that it sticks out in this movie is not because the mob felt forced on, but again, the first forty minutes was way more character development and right. relationship development than you would expect from a movie. The best like scenes this. are like the two of them sitting in a bath together. Yeah, just, like, and like, you know they you both have, have their feet in the bath. You have to walk out and heat the water again, and just the two of them becoming 
fast friends. Yes. And you never, like, question it. Like, no, this makes sense. They are the best of friends forever. On the second day, the next morning, she comes in. And, like, they sound like an old married couple. Yeah. And it's in the best way possible. And then it's sort of, then all of the plot stuff comes in. Well, I think it's also hearkening, if we're hearkening back to older Hollywood, is Some Like a Hot came up a lot for obvious reasons, right? We're performing, we're cross-dressing, uh, we're lying. And that has a mob, but that the mob stuff is the inciting incident. Right. So it doesn't feel as forced. Uh, where this is halfway through, they're like, we forgot the mob scene. Crap, let's put it in. <laughs> they've like, I put, They've mentioned that he's part of the mob several times. But it's so mm. weird. Every time they mention it, it feels like, wait, this guy's a mobster? And it, then when it comes up, even though they've talked about it, it still feels awkward. It always did feel like he was wanted people to think he was, so he had more power and influence in Paris, but wasn't actually. And so by the time it, we were like, wait, it was real? It, it felt like there was a missing component. And like what we're doing is we're turning the heat on King. Turning the heat uh-huh. up on King. We're like, now your people are here, where that's not really what we bought in for like we want the heat turned up on victoria and toddy right like that's why we bought into this movie originally and now king has become not necessarily the main character as far as arcing goes but the main character as far as these plot Plot. changes go and that that does sort of like jar you and out of our big five let's say the five main characters he is the least interesting yeah i did want to talk about interesting early on He's interesting early on, but it, it I, I feel like we lose that as time well, goes on. I sort of thought, I, I was wondering if this was a commentary on like the Clark Gables of the screwball comedies of like, you guys know we were all looking at the bad guy and the girl, the Claudette mm-hmm. Colbert. Like they were the, the, you Clark Gables of these screwball comedies or even Cary Grant, like nobody cared about you. You know, I thought that like that's sort of how I felt about King. They're like a cipher, right? They're kind of just like. Like a place that the audience projects Plus, themselves into. Their their masculinity means that they don't actually get to make decisions. They're the most boring characters because their decisions are all based on what does masculinity tell me what to do. And although King is more interesting than those guys back in the day because yeah. this is a more forward facing movie, uh, it's still like, well, I have to do this because this is my job and I'm a man and here's my penis. And if so, if the mob didn't show up, King getting addicted to bar fights because the public <laughs> thinks. He, like that would be. So Is that much your favorite ZZ Top song? Yes, it was just addicted to bar fights. Yeah, addicted that, to bar that's fights. What they're all been. Some people say Lagrange, but no, come on. What if he got addicted uh, to bar fights, but then that kind of wasn't enough, and so he started hanging out with this guy who oh. like, taught him how to make bombs and stuff? <laughs> but then it turns out that's just like a part of his own personality. Buildings go boom. Did we just write a movie? <laughs> I, think I think we did. Also, in twenty years, we just started. Uh, fascistic terrorist group accidentally because of that <laughs> whoopsies <laughs> <laughs> you all missed the point what i was saying doesn't matter no mike i want to go back to it it's just that me and greg had three important things to say while you were talking <laughs> all right well, in a the, row the, the interesting stuff about king very much he's like i know you're not a man and victoria's victor goes why he's like because i'm attracted to you she's like hmm like that is fucking fascinating him saying stuff if you were a man and knock your block off and like the going back and forth and him having to wrestle with his masculinity is interesting and the mob stuff just gets in the way of him dealing with that like it feels like for a while when they're finally the the montage of them that they're learning they're not compatible she likes the opera he likes boxing okay they're not before you start rapping with a cartoon cat like i need you to calm down (laughs) but instead of dealing with that and being like hey there's interesting sexual issues going on here and we don't really like each other we're not into the same stuff let's move on the mob comes in so they're like we'll be together forever i think that king is such a nuanced character but i hate how his dick dar is so good where he's like oh that's not a man like Mm -hmm. he just knows so surely thinking back to uh some like a hot there's there's a a moment where it feels like they're really harking back to it that does not fly uh because the i don't care if you're a man they kiss she says i'm not a man he goes i still don't care but he at this point he's been a peeping top and watched her bathe yeah. so it wasn't like a big revelation and <laughs> him being like love rules everything around me <laughs> but that is a choice he he does actively make the choice to appear to be dating a man yeah mm-hmm. And we that, see, I think, we see like, like a lot of pillow talk of him yeah. arguing. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I like that's 
that I could see that being a big challenge for a guy like that. And he really does step up because that's what his heart needs. And that's not a, that's also not a very masculine way to approach right. that. Not a squash level challenge, but a challenge. The moment that he he twists is uh, when he gets his ass beat by a gay guy at the boxing ring, and he's like, "Okay, I I could be seen again." (laughs) I guess they can do anything. (laughs) (laughs) They can do anything. All right, we're gonna take a break, and when we come back, this movie won one Academy Award, but tonight it's gonna win three Moody's. Before we give Victor Victoria its much deserved awards, let's get to some recommendations. And I gotta say, guys. Um, I was sort of recommended out all of the stuff I wanted to recommend for this movie. I have done this season, mm-hmm. uh, the birdcage and music and lyrics, but this was a rough one for me. Greg, what'd you get? I was going to go with the birdcage. Oh shit. Sorry. Should we start over? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, and what I like, the reason I thought of the, the birdcage with this is just the way in which that is about how the gay community has to interact with the straight community but also it has just a lot more of like the intra-gay community stuff and that really just does make so much more of a three-dimensional space and i feel like it opens up for a lot more entertainment and then the heart aspect of it where you really feel like you're seeing loving and caring three-dimensional people and that's just so nice rather than the two-dimensional stereotypes you know what i think this is a lot of the pressure that the movie boys has on it is that what it's called the new billy eichner movie the rom-com oh yeah. Oh, bros bros Bros. thank you um where so many gay movies are made with straight audiences in mind and i think that he has a lot of that pressure or the film does of like are you going to explore that intra-gay community stuff or are you going to be like here's a gay guy now let me break it down like almost like a dear white people for gay people, you know? And yeah. I, I like I hope that it's just gay as fuck and we have to catch up, you know? Agreed. Mike, what do you got? Uh like you a, uh, a lot throughout this season. I've I've talked about some like a hot also redid it tonight or The Music Man. But uh <laughs> I'm actually going to recommend something that you uh, thought I was going to recommend during Tootsie. Uh it's Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Uh, if we're talking about performances and and gender fluidity and and queerness and those communities, check it out. It's awesome. The film, the f- uh, yeah. I I mean, if you can go see the stage show, it's amazing and a completely different beast in the film. But that's probably harder to get to than the movie. Does it blow the movie away though? Yeah. Yeah. I it's so hot, I man. Liked when you're the sitting movie and I loved the live. Show. I know. Like, look at those people <laughs> performing for me. Like, that's. That's They're so dancing hard to be and singing at the same time, <laughs> and I, I I know there's no cuts. <laughs> um, I am going to go with a movie I think Mike has recommended before, but it's because of the disgusting place that he is born. But I'm going to go with the Philadelphia Story because I think that this is a perfect example of a lot of what the movie was trying to do that like really inspired Blake Edwards in mm-hmm. a lot of the ways that he shot and wrote the movie. Of uh, I need the dialogue to be fast but I need the situ. I think that a lot of our issues with the farcical screwball additions are solved by the Philadelphia story. You know, like how we keep adding element after element after element. Mm-hmm. Also, it's made me want to go back and watch it to see the scenes between Cary Grant and Jimmy Stewart. Maybe there was a little bit of a love triangle going on, you know? Some vibing going on yeah. there. Vibes. All right, Greg, cringiest. Well, first of all, talk to me. Like we we talked in the intro about the cringiness of this movie. How was there a lot of haha gay moments? I felt like no. Mike and I talked about that one moment where um, Squash comes out, and there's like a second there where you feel uncertain. But I thought overall one of all, one of the least cringy movies we've seen. I don't know if it's the least cringy, but one of the least cringy. Yeah. What would there, it, if you had to pick one moment? Okay. I didn't love the like hotel manager who like she kind Oof. of said I'll have sex with you for a meatball which the movie never makes it clear how much she really meant that sometimes it's a joke sometimes it's not I have noticed in 82 there was a lot more like soft consent or like these like you know like hesitantly given consent at one point and then like obviously revoked or something the hotel manager like is like basically like okay she said a second ago 
Like, mm-hmm. the, and so it's just like, I, I literally did cringe because I was like, ah, that's very uncomfortable. And it just, then the way the rest of the movie plays it from there, like forward, it's this weird message of that, like of mur- really murky consent and, and there being like a, a blurred line there that I wasn't totally comfortable with. I totally get that. But the way that like the movie starts with Robert Preston in bed and then a boy, you know, his 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 dude pops up right behind him and like oh mm-hmm. shit that this is a gay movie and then that's our first introduction to heterosexual males i thought that yeah. that sort of like let us know exactly what point. we were in for <laughs> yeah yeah like that yeah this, this definitely could be a case where the movie is causing me to cringe but mm-hmm. i am definitely cringing mike what do you got King peeps Julie Andrews bathing, and that's when he's like, well, I can pursue her now because I've <laughs> confirmed this person owed me their truth, even though we've only interacted like twice before, and I am a peeping Tom and a voyeur, but nope, we will fall in love, and the movie never deals with it, ever. Was it cringier than Maid Marian seeing Kevin Costner's butt? No, that's everybody should see Kevin Costner's butt. Everyone should. His and Maid Marian sh- had like the she was flustered and it was an accident. Yeah, she just yeah, she hide in the bathroom to. to stare at some shit. She was so embarrassed. No oh, gosh. All right, we'll give that one to Mike. Director's signature. This is our first Blake Edwards movie. Mike, what did you make of Blake Edwards? Uh, I don't know. I think I've seen clips of his stuff in the past. Uh, there, there's not one thing like just watching that was like this, but looking at his oeuvre. Uh, and how many goddamn Pink Panthers there are. Uh, <laughs> this guy loves say this sh- Panthers that are pink. The shot of Bernstein in the snow chattering and like yeah, the, the <laughs> button of him coming out and the guy who sees him break into the room and leave. And he, Bernstein's saying, oh, your room has has heat? Must be nice. So like that very cartoony vibe of it. I get that. Greg? I'm going to go with what I thought was legitimately – the funniest moment of the movie which is this inspector who does not seem to belong in the movie at all seems to just be like he did not want to make a movie that didn't have at least some pink panther character in it uh but when that guy like sits down in the chair and the other guy goes be careful and he says i'm always careful and he's like no because that chair is broken and then the spill he takes like that was the movie being so goofy so stupid that whole scene only exists so that he can take that tumble but it also made me roar with laughter it it really is so funny he, that that character is my other cringe moment is that character existing but that that is a saving grace moment yeah i mean it's better than the addition of say blake edwards movie where he adds mickey rooney as an asian person that doesn't need to be in the movie mm, yeah like i i don't mind in a comedy just throwing in a guy who's like i'm gonna come in i'm gonna get some laughs i'm gonna bounce i'm gonna take some tumbles yeah that's all i'm there for uh, all right. Uh, that one is going to go to Mike as well. I do think that there's a little bit of not like maybe not maybe like Joe Dante or John Landis cartooniness, mm. but there is a level of cartooniness to this guy. Uh, Greg, pound for pound performance. I think we narrowed it down to like five <laughs> leads. Uh, this is so tough. And this, but... Yeah, this is a rough one. I expect all five of these people to be nominated for Moody's at the end of the season. But when I really ask myself who I thought was doing the most in this movie, for me, it's Leslie Ann Warren, Norma Cassidy. Uh, She's got so many different little micro performances in here. I think breathes a lot of uh, three-dimensionality into the character and seems to get the joke and then also bring something kind of like fresh and new to it. And... uh, yeah, I'm going Norma Cassidy, or rather, I guess it's Leslie Ann Warren. Her conversation with Toddy about, wait, no, you can't be gay because you're handsome, first mm-hmm. of all. And second of all, I, I could change you back to straight. Like That was so big in the 80s and 90s. I don't know if that will ever, like, if that will persevere as, an, as something that was like a plot point in the 80s and 90s. But the whole, like, if a girl thinks you're gay, she'll want to turn you straight. yeah. But uh, Ladies th- and gentlemen, if you did not watch stuff in this time, let us just tell you that was persistent in like every single comedy. I think it's how of Jason the 80s Lee got 90s. his career in the nineties. Every role he said that to somebody. <laughs> I just but like in that scene, like her wide eyed curiosity that she yeah. brings, you know, where it's not as And she's like, so present in that scene. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, who's better than Leslie and Warren? I mean, it's hacky. I think it's Julie Andrews is undeniable, and we did not talk about her nearly enough That's throughout true. this. She's both Victor and episode. Victoria. She's as, so talented that you end up taking her for granted no matter what. 
but like I think as a kid, only knowing her from Mary Poppins and I don't SOB, know, Mary Poppins and SOB, uh, aka Sound of Music, it's the, she's not acting in those, right? She's such a character that I, I don't care about Mary Poppins' interiority. <laughs> and then I think Sound of Music sucks in general. So watching this and being like, oh, she can break glass and pop champagne bottles when she sings, which is amazing. But how much life and and interiority she puts into Victor Victoria is is huge. And and have her be like scammy in the beginning was so funny and weird and so against type for me to watch her do that. And then her whole arc and like the very mature way. And I think maybe that's is like she doesn't arc, she forces people around her to arc, right? But like her dealing with King is so interesting and then her dealing with Toddy is adorable and the two of them are, are a great fucking comedic duo. I mean what you're describing is a boring character, but I mean, we have to keep in mind that, like, she she one steps or she oversteps Dustin Hoffman because Dustin Hoffman was not a man trying to be a woman trying to be a man. Right. You know, she does, like, what would a man be like if they dress like a woman, but also I'm a woman? That's that's yeah. fucking crazy. And you can see that how she, how she moves as Victor victoria on stage is so different as how she moves victor through her life versus how she moves as her actual victorianess it's 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 bananas little things are like when she's talking to someone she'll uh as the count she'll hit them to talk to them yeah but then when somebody talks to her she'll get hit she'll be like what the why would you fucking do that to me i'm just <laughs> sitting here she only smiles as the count one time ever and king marchand mm-hmm. catches her when she does it and it's like, oh, okay, so you can smile. She's like the like mean boy face. Mm-hmm, I think yeah. she really does a good job like <laughs> doing that. Which is, I mean, that is how dudes act. Like that is how dudes act as dudes, much less girls as boys as whatever. Like, and dude, when you're a guy, it's performative, right? I'm right. Gonna put on, yes. I'm gonna mean. This mug, is my like, tough face. This is I'm gonna act like a man uh, because I'm a man. Like, Here, here's a thing I just thought of and nobody else has ever said is all genders performative. <laughs> what, Mike, whoa. You bury okay. that at the end of the show? Oh. We're born naked. Everything else is drag. I wish I could get points. Uh, that's going to go to Mike, too. I think Mike swept uh, an <laughs> unscored show. Good which, job, Mike. Which makes sense because this movie was nominated for seven of, uh, Oscars but only won one, and it was score. So, And that is what Mike just did. When we come back, we'll finally end the show. Well, that is very, very funny or very sad. And perhaps now you have something to think about or very problematic. And perhaps we have something to think about. But in any event, I'm sure you have some reaction to what you're listening to. So why not check us out on the social media? You can go to Instagram or Twitter and find us at your pop filter email contacts at your pop filter hey everybody keep watching them movies gentlemen victor victoria was a bonus show which means it's not in the elite eight but is it one of the best movies of 1982 yes it's a little crazy and maybe just because of having never heard of it like it it didn't have that 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 stock but i think it could it's one of the best movies we watched this season yeah, it's better than at least a couple of the the bracket movies. But also, you know, the 82, we've said this before, but 82 is just pointed out that it's really hard to say, like, these eight movies are the good movies of 1982. You leave a lot on the table, and this is one of them. I don't think it would have had a huge chance of winning, but I definitely think that it's... I liked it more than 48 Hours. Oh, shit. 48 Hours. <laughs> that That's crazy that that happened this season. That's, <laughs> that's so long That ago. is a lifetime ago. <laughs> I, I I can't wait to do the last show of this season and be like, 48 hours was, um, when was that? <laughs> <laughs> That's Gary Busey and Keanu Reeves. They surf, right? How many mm-hmm. sandwiches does he demand? <laughs> two meatball two. sandwiches, Mike. It's always two meatball sandwiches. Uh, yeah, I I think that this is a great movie. Um, not perfect, but I love it for, it, for its flaws, one of those movies. Um, mm-hmm, I do think that it has a lot of... Moody's, though, at least nominations, oh, if not yeah. winners in its future. Uh, that's going to be it. We are wrapping up the 82 season. I'm not exactly sure what is in the future, but we have a couple more episodes or zero, one, two. I don't know. <laughs> uh, that's what I mean by I'm not sure. Who knows what's about to happen? But the finale is coming, guys. The 1982 finale. Are you excited? And who are you wearing? 
It's a gosh darn freight train. I'm going to wear my dead brother around my neck. Hmm. Like King Shark? Like a King Shark. I'm going to go with basketball shorts, Ryan. Uh, this is my first podcast recording wearing basketball shorts, and I liked it. I thought it was oh, easy, right? Yeah. I will often be in normal human clothes, and right before we start recording, throw on basketball shorts like I did today. And it's... See, I'm the exact opposite. I will be in uh, gross clothes until we start recording, and then I'll put on like a shirt and pants. A tux. And a cummerbund? Also? And a cummerbund. Yeah. I love a good cummerbund. All right. For Mike, for Greg, I am Ryan. And please, as always, keep watching those movies. Movies.